You're listening to Sarah Hagen backstage with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick both inside and outside of the music business. Welcome to Sarah Hagen backstage. My guest today, Jonathan Allman, balances his full-time position as manager of the percussion department at Berklee College of Music with a very full recording and live music schedule. He has won the Boston Music Award for Session Musician of the Year many times over, and he is known on social media for his incredibly beautiful product photography, as well as for his creative interpretation of musical instruments. We are going to talk about all of these things and more, so come along with me as I catch up with Jonathan Ullman. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Hi, it's great what? to see you. I know, virtually. Virtually, even though we are close, you're in Boston, and mm-hmm. I am south of Boston, so we're not too far from each other. Yeah, this is awesome. I, I've been waiting to be a part of this podcast for a long time. Oh, I've been waiting to have you on for a long time. I'm so excited about it. So tell us how you've been. It, it's uh, been a crazy couple of years and um, you're doing really great stuff. We're going to kind of jump into all of that. But in general, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm actually at Berkeley today. I have a bunch of stuff to get ready for. And it's always easier when, especially today, I'm a, uh, that um, it's pretty slow so I can... Um, get in here and and pretty much spend the day in the uh, in, in a room and get everything done. Um, but everything's been good. Pandemic was wild. Uh, it feels like the pandemic, while it's still going on, seems like it's been years of sort of a, a restructuring of how we do things in this industry. So um, actually worked out pretty well for me because I do a lot of studio work. So there was a whole couple years where people couldn't play live. So they said, you know what, I guess I'm going to work on that record that I never had time to do. So luckily I work in a studio that has ample space and just with the producer in the control room and me out in the live room, we got uh, numerous records completed and in a very safe way. And then it was kind of cool because now that things are coming back, now all those people asked me to, you know, play these songs that we recorded live. So you know, mm-hmm. when things slowed down, they picked up in other areas and then kind of balancing out now. So it's it's been really good. And it's cool to be back at, at Berkeley, you know, full time without any restrictions. Absolutely. Yeah, that must that must feel great. And let's talk a little bit about what you do at Berkeley, because when when someone would ask me, what does Jonathan do at Berkeley? I would say everything. <laughs> <laughs> He does everything Um, because in my experience working with you on projects and events and everything, uh, you're kind of like really doing a whole lot. So um, let's talk about what you do there. Sure. So uh, I guess my title is uh, I I sort of manage the department, the percussion department at Berkeley. Um, So sort of the day to day operations. Um, and that's it's pretty broad. I mean, it, it does have an administrative role, but it also, you know, incorporates, you know, all the visiting artists that come in and, you know, I oversee, you know, anywhere from 500 to 600 students and the faculty and the rooms and the events that we sort of have, sort of the logistics of everything. And there's really three staff members that are directly sort of running the department. So there's the two chairs and then which for a long time, we only had one, um, but there's two chairs in me. So it's like they have their role, you know, to bring visibility to the the department. And then I sort of make sure that things run smoothly, you know, that the kids can come in and they can graduate and there's not a whole lot of hiccups along the way. Um, And, you know, on the side of that, it's like, I also have experience with photography and graphic design and social media. So that kind of fell on my plate as well. So, you know, the marketing side of things, you know, the the day to day, the curriculum, the logistics of running a, you know, a percussion department at a very high visible, you know, music school. So so all of that, you know, uh, but every day is different. So if there's something that they need me to do that I don't know how to do, you know, I, I kind of do my research and, and fulfill that need and, and get that under my belt. Right. You figure it out. Right. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned photography too. You, you actually have a degree in photography. Yeah. So I, I went back to school, I think back in 2011, I got my master's in digital photography. Which I just have to point out, anyone who follows you on Instagram knows your photography skills, your digital skills, like the, the content that you create is so beautiful. Um, the companies that you represent are very lucky to have you as an artist because you create this content that's like gorgeous. It shows off the products in a beautiful light. Um, you know, you, you are, you're always creating incredible pictures. And so anyone who follows you knows that anyone who's not following you yet should go check out it's JMU drums, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and I, well, I first very, very appreciative of that. Um, and, you know, when I was in school, you know, taking, and even as an undergrad, I was taking photography too, but then, you know, I actually went and got my degree in it. But the funny thing was after I graduated, I was like, I don't want to take photos anymore because they, they kind of make you take photos of what they want you to take photos of. And it was like, I don't like taking pictures of people. I don't like, wedding photography or any of the stuff that can really make me money you know so i used to like taking pictures of buildings because i can do the you know i they just stay right there and i can go find the angle that that i want to see the building in yes. um so then i started taking pictures of drums because i mean that's what i i love to do and you know there was there's a mutual understanding with with endorsements it's like you know they support me and I want to support them and, and, and show what, um, you know, what, what products they have and stuff like that. So it was like, Oh, this is super easy. And I don't have to use my social media for anything, per, you know, personal or anything like that. I can, it can be like a product photography type of, you know, social media page as well as a little bit in insight into my life and, you know, a little bit on, you know, on the backside of personal stuff, but um, it's fun. I, I feel like, I feel like it keeps me creative where the only thing I know need to do each day is take a, you know, some sort of picture of drums. Then it kind of allows me to be like, all right, so how do I look at this from a different angle kind of thing? And, but, but I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all the people that kind of go to my page and say, I don't even like drums, but I like looking at the ones you photograph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it just, it's very creative. What you do is very, very creative. And I, I have been with you when you are, you know, figuring out an angle on something and it's really great to watch you work. I, I feel like I feel like I've been your assistant in that aspect in some in some cases where you're like, hey, if I move this here and I do this like this and then you stand here and take a picture and I'm like, OK, I will just do exactly what you say. Because, our, our direction. No, right? it's, it's I, I know I usually like have my shot. I know exactly, you know, what I, what I want. I, I used to do that when I go to the vault, it was like, I already knew what, you know, what I wanted to take a picture of in there and mm -hmm. go in, go out and then, and then be done with it kind of thing. Yeah, but, exactly. But definitely, exactly. definitely ask people to like, you know, help me out if there's unofficial photo, pho photography assistance available. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And like also the locations that you shoot in are always, I'm like, how, how did you get your drums on top of a building or <laughs> in the barn or, you know, with the perfect uh, vision of the, the Zakem bridge, you know? So like, are you always scouting out locations when you go somewhere? Are you like, you know what, I'm going to come back here with a drum set and take a picture. I think there was a, I mean, the thing about drums and you know, this full well, it's like, there's such a pain in the butt to yeah to move so if i like was taking a picture of like a harmonica that would be so easy because then i could just put <laughs> it in any location but there are certain things where i'm you know one of the things that i love is is a is the floor i think anytime i'm in a place that has a really cool floor either like rustic wood or um something unique something that because i like to shoot above of a drum set so that you can see all the circles. I mean, drums are just made up as of circles kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to see that. So the floor becomes like a, a incorporation of that picture because that's the, that's going to be sort of the, like the backdrop, uh, right? canvas. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. your canvas for what this drum set is sitting on. So it's so funny when I'll get text messages from friends or people in other places and they're like, dude, I'm in this place. 
the floor is so cool. You, I, you know, all I can think about is how cool of one of your drum set photos would be like on this floor kind of thing. So it actually has turned into something that people actually think about like, oh, this would be a cool floor for Jonathan to take a photo on kind of thing. But um, so it's making its way, but it's, that's kind of exactly right. I definitely go to places that have a background that can really emphasize, you know, the beauty of the instrument kind of thing. Absolutely. And in one of the spaces that's featured highly in your photography and has a very, very cool floor is the bridge, right? The mm -hmm. studio. Yeah. And um, so let's talk a little bit about your studio work, because that is a huge part of what you do. And let me just congratulate you because you have won the Boston Music Award Session Musician of the Year, like over and over again and and highly deserved because you do so much session work. You put out so many, um, so many songs and and albums and different styles of music. So tell us a little bit about your recording work. Well, thank you. This is a very complimentary interview, and it makes me feel <laughs> really awesome. Um, you deserve that. So, so, for me, you know, when whenever you sort of, you know, one of the questions you get a lot is, um, "What do you prefer, live or studio drumming?" kind of thing. And of course, the the right answer is, well, I love a balance of both. But like, in all honesty, studio work for me is is you know kind of takes that that step above live. I mean, I do love playing live and stuff like that. But you know, I grew up in a family of artists, and they all have physical representations of the work that they've done over the years, you know, mm -hmm. the first sculpture they made versus the most recent sculpture they made, how they progressed, what, where they, what uh, emotional state they were in when they made this decades worth of, you know, artwork kind of thing. So for me, the only way to have some sort of legacy of me as an artist or as a drummer is the records that I played on, because I can see how I've grown as a drummer, how, what kind of music styles I played. If I played on a rock record back in 20, you know, uh, 2000, um, how did I play that, you know, that beat then versus how I play on a rock record now kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my legacy. That's what I can look back on and say, this is what I've encompassed. Now, the, now the live stuff is great, but if you're playing in front of a thousand people every night, like, it that's awesome but it's another it's just your it's that setup and just put in the next city and then put in the next city um and i used to i it was you know and i and i love that actually the thing about live that i love equally as much as playing live on stage you know is the places that i've gotten to see you know and so you know the different venues and meeting the different people along the way so that's all really important and kind of kind of brings the whole package together but the studio work is really for me, where I find my I'm most creative um, and where I can really be a part of some, because somebody's hiring me to be a part of something very personal to them. And that 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 means a lot. You know, that's like, wow, you're entrusting that what I put on this song or on this record is going to be uh, valuable to the message that you're trying to put out. Now, on the, just to, to sort of like, uh, tie in that piece is I don't work in LA. I mean, I've, I've done sessions in LA, in LA and in Nashville and stuff like that, where all the big records are coming out of uh, their city and stuff like that. And for me in Boston, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great market, but you know, if you look at my resume, it's not, you know, you're not seeing mega pop stars and you're not seeing, you know, the who's who in the industry that you're that you're like, you know, that's always a tough question for me. Like, well, tell me somebody that I would know that you've played with. And it's like, well, I don't know if you know this person in my world. They're very well respected. And mm -hmm. in this industry, they're they're kind of like I've been fortunate to play with the people just because I'm old. I've been uh, been able to play with the people who inspired the the people that you do know because they have a name brand on Spotify or, or coming out of LA. But if you, if I talk to them and say, Hey, I played with this person, they'd be like, man, that person really inspired me when I was young to, you know, so that's cool for me, but I get to also play with artists who aren't discovered yet. The ones that 
you kind of crystal balling it. You know, you're hoping that this is the record that's going to launch them or catapult them to stardom. And to know that I got in on the ground level, you know, is really important to me because that means that I can, that's a, that's an, another valuable skill set that I see potential in an artist enough to be like, Hey, listen, you have no money and you don't know what you're very green to this, but you have a raw talent and I see it mm-hmm. and I'm going to work with you and my producer to get in. We're going to make you a great record that you, you weren't able to make elsewhere. And then someday down the line when you, you know, um, you're working with all the greatest people, you know, outside of from this area, it'll, I'll be able to say, well, I worked with that artist first before anybody else. So mm-hmm. yeah, it would be nice to work with a, you know, Beyonce, Katy Perry, or, you know, sure. or Lady Gaga or Billie Eilish. It'd be awesome to work with them. But I, I would have, I like working with the people now who nobody knows about yet. And I do yeah. that day in and day out. So there's something exciting about seeing a raw talent before anybody's gotten to them and gotten in their head and all that mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, yes. yes. And we do a lot of that at the bridge, which is to tie it back to the bridge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I've had this conversation before about like artists first albums and I love, I always love going back. If I discover someone who's maybe on their like third or fourth album, I love going back to see what they did first. And I'm always surprised by how different it is sometimes and how how kind of like raw it is in a lot of ways and and how authentic maybe because you're right like you you're working with these artists before they've been um influenced (laughs) maybe like by by the industry or by people telling them what they should be doing or how they should be making music and um, I love the fact that you're kind of coming in to someone's raw vision and helping them make it a reality. That's huge to me. Um, so, and and it's hard too, because you are interpreting someone else's full vision, their creative vision. Like you're having to go in there and, and, and try to understand what they want from that, from that music. And it's something that's very close to them because it is something that, um, is raw for them. Right. And yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's an incredible opportunity. Well, the other thing is like a lot of times I come in and I work with a, the producer who, you know, very well archetype and, um, and it's almost like that first record, they have no limitations. It's like, well, let's see what you can do. There's no, you know, this album doesn't have to necessarily be super cohesive or you have to have already known your sound at this point. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to, do this together your first album may be slightly disjointed but that Mm -hmm. second one you're gonna you're gonna have the confidence to go and be like nah this is what i really like doing on the first album and that sort of creative liberty and the entrusting that they have for us to go we think this is a direction that you could be really good in but we're not gonna put any pressure on you we're not trying to pigeonhole you into anything specific um so we're gonna allow you to do what you need to do and we're going to make great music around that. And also you got to think about um, the budgets are limited at this point. And it's like, we got, we got eight hours to do 10 songs and I got to get all my stuff done and we're going to make it great. And you just got to trust that it's going to come out awesome. And they, you know, cause down the line when they're famous, they're like, you know, got months and months and months and months to make whatever record they want. Now they got a weekend, right. you know, and that yeah. puts pressure on us. But it also is kind of exciting because mm-hmm. it's like look what we were able to create with a very limited budget and a very limited amount of time. And we a lot of times we hear from artists for re- records down the line when they've worked with other producers and they go, that was still my favorite record that I ever worked on was that first one I did. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have to own it. Right. Yeah. I love that. I love that so much. And and so then in contrast, the live stuff that you do, because you do play out a lot live and um, you're supporting different acts and different styles of music. How are you? I know I see you doing like singer songwriter stuff and I see you doing hip hop stuff. And um, how are you kind of like balancing that? You know, you're kind of like going from one gig to the next and they're so different. How, how is that? Well, do you remember when you were in like 
school and you would cram for a test and as soon as the test was over you'd forget everything that you that you did it's exactly like that like i will if i have two gigs in a night and they're completely different it's like leading up to that first gig i'm listening to all the stuff on the in the car and outside of the venue in the car and i memorize it and i got it and i got on stage and as soon as i on my way to the next gig i don't ever listen to the, you know i don't listen to anything about that again and i get ready for the next one but it, i think i think the key is you just have to be comfortable that when you're up there whatever issues may arise or whatever sort of situations that you need to navigate during a, during a live show that you're confident enough to know how to navigate it at this, at this point. Um, but it's also for me, it's really exciting to be able to go from a hip hop show to a singer songwriter show to a punk show, you know, all in like either the same night or the next day. Um, because it's kind of like, it never feels, you know, the same. I'm, I mean, usually I've gone on tours that have gone on for a month and it's like, I never want to play these songs again at the end of the, sure. you know, at the end of the tour. So I, I don't really have that. I haven't had that in a long time to feel like I'm, this is, I need something different kind of thing. Cause it's something different every night, but like it, it, it goes back to that piece where it's, where it's like somebody thinks or, or values what I do enough to be like, I want this person up there. I feel confident this person behind the drums kind of, you know, leading thing, leading us through the songs. This is the person I want back there. So that gives me that, that extra feeling of like, well, I want to make sure that I, you know, that I show up and, and do what I need to do kind of thing. Um, and hopefully down the road, you know, my name gets passed off to the, you know, the big, big, superstars at one point sure yeah i mean and that's how and that's how it happens too you make make a reputation for yourself of being like a really great addition to someone's band right um and then and then that gets passed around because it is a small industry that we're that we're a part of for sure and i think that just briefly but i think everybody's idea of success is different like you know i think that in my eyes i feel like i'm extremely successful mm -hmm. i don't feel like i'm not successful because there's no superstars on my resume um i feel like like at this point if somebody says do you feel like your career has been successful absolutely mm -hmm. i've checked off so many boxes um and i and i still love to do this every single day and it's still exciting for me so in in my eyes this is successful night and, and i feel like it doesn't require that the industry's idea of what's successful is, you know, kind of clouds that, you know, your own your own idea of what it is. For sure. I think that's really, really an incredibly important point that you just made. Um, yeah. Don't let anyone else's vision of success cloud what you are are working toward or, you know, have have achieved. Because like what you've achieved in your world, in in this world, in the music industry has been incredible. I just mentioned the awards. You've been in magazines. You know, you've had this success um, on social media where you get, you know, tons and tons of, of comments and likes on your posts. And you're creating this amazing content that's shared by companies and, you know, other other outlets. And so... You know, and the other part about it, let me just mention this. The other part that you're really successful at is um, the relationship part, because I can talk to someone from wherever we just went through this. I just had a conversation with someone from Israel who said, oh, you're you're in the Boston area. You must know my friend Jonathan Allman. And it's so funny to me that we can have this conversation. People just know who you are. They follow you on Instagram or they've had a conversation with you. And you're just an incredibly uh, friendly and, you know, super like helpful person to other people. And I think that goes a long way, too. So, um, yeah, you definitely have success in many different avenues. Yeah. I'm, and I think like it's, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, even if I got that call from a big, you know, pop star and said, hey, can you come out and do this gig? It's like, yeah, but I also have this gig with this person that you don't know that nobody's ever heard of, yeah. you know, and I need to get back for that one as well. Absolutely. That's also very important for sure. Um, 
And and you talking about live music and playing out, I always see you playing the coolest venues. You know, there we have a lot of venues in Boston that are great. But, you know, I, I see you playing like the Museum of Fine Arts or, you know, just I, I'm trying to think of some of the other places you played recently where I'm just like, wow, that's was it the Gardner Museum that you were at? Uh, not the guy we play, uh, you know, I've done some shows inside the, uh, planetarium at the museum of science, um, mm -hmm. MFA definitely. Um, I've played in, oh, inside the museum of fine arts, there's a courtyard that they play under the stars. Um, yes. Isabella Stewart Gardner museum. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of cool places. It, it, you know, it's almost like. It depends on the band, but Boston is is really cool in that a lot of these really like prestigious institutions are somewhat removed from the community. I mean, they are these like, you know, these, you know, places that everyone kind of looks at and doesn't feel like they have any sort of, con you know, connection to them. Symphony, you know, Boston Symphony Hall and stuff. It's like they they have this sort of stigma that they don't they only care about you know certain you know classes of people or only certain you know um races or whatever can come to their institutions and that's not true they they a lot of times have people who are working at these places who are trying to find that bridge to bring the community closer to them so that they can be a part of these you know these networks and stuff like that um and a lot of times it takes someone like me or or a band like the band that i play in still gold a lot of times we're at the forefront in this city to go knock on these doors and say hey listen we want to do an event here because we grew up in the inner cities uh, of Roxbury and Mattapan. and when i was a kid there i never felt like i could come to this institution and do something well, mm -hmm. now I'm at a place where I can walk in and speak with the community engagement people and say, we want to put on a, an event here. And all of a sudden, the museum or the or the symphony hall or the, um, you know, this other place goes, goes, this is really valuable to us mm -hmm. because now we where we become much more visible to the people that we we're living in their neighborhoods kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so whether I've, we've done, we've unveiled artwork in the, in the America's wing of the Museum of, uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, we were the f first hip hop band to collaborate with the Boston Symphony Orchestra to the point where like all the players it, for the Boston Symphony Orchestra were ready, were, were like, this is the best like gig that we've ever had, that we get to learn this music. And we, it was even like, we even brought on our own um, members of the band to write the parts for the players in the in the you know for the symphony. Wow. Um, so those kinds of collaborations are extremely important. It may not be the venue that has you know obviously you go to the House of Blues they got all the PA system and everything sounds perfect and they got stage mm -hmm. and all that stuff. It's not like that at at these places. And the sound may not be the best thing you've ever heard, but the experience is going to be something that, you know, you go to 100 shows at regular venues in Boston and you go to one that's in the planetarium where you're where you're watching on the dome screen. You're leaning back in your chair and watching an experience and we're playing. You don't even see us because we're just playing the music that goes to the show that we that we've curated inside that place. Was it the best sounding show? Probably not. Was it the best experience? It was probably up there for somebody, you know, somebody to to be like, wow, I watched a hip hop show in the Planetarium and the Museum of Science that I haven't been to since I was 10 years old. And these on people school, were in right? On a school field trip or something exactly. like that, right? Yeah, that's amazing. That is that is super cool. Um, yeah, so I, I just, when I, when I think of you and I think about the venues that you've played, it's just like these really great opportunities. And I think, um, one thing about you is that I always see you like creating new opportunities for yourself. Like you go out and you seek out relationships and you seek out this, this work and, you know, and, and not to say that it doesn't come to you as well, but 
I do see you, you work really hard at what you do and, and that's an admirable quality as well. Um, and I kind of want to go at this curve, a very young age, right? You started playing drums and getting into, like, you talked a little bit about the creativity in your family. Um, and I just am wondering, like, how that influenced you to become a musician. So growing up in a family of artists was, was really kind of awesome for me because it was like... Um, you sort of get in, introduced to the arts at a very early age. And my dad was a sculptor and my brother's a sculptor. And my mom is a photographer and a painter and all of the, all of the above. Um, and the cool thing for me was I loved music and it's a very supportive environment, no matter what your medium is. We all show up to each other's shows. We all sort of learn, you know, about the artwork that each other does. I mean, my dad, he, him and my brother are like best friends kind of thing, because they both work in found object sculpting, which is really, really cool. And my brother obviously knows about music, but my dad's learned a lot about music and what it takes to be a musician and, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a real support system as to, um, you know, as an upbringing um, and why it's important in the arts, because the arts are always fighting for support, whether it's financial mm -hmm. or for people to see what you're doing or, you know, stuff like that. So um, the thing that that I that I I really um, I really love is that my dad always told me that what you do should should be not. He never used the word hobby, but it was like, don't make art in your don't make it your like your job because if if it becomes your job then it's then it becomes this thing that puts pressure on you to always you know have to need it to make money and mm -hmm. and i it you know at this point obviously i've gotten to the point where it is part of my job kind of thing but i always keep in the back of my mind that you know i should just enjoy this as something that i do and something that i'm passionate about my dad was an architect He's a sculptor, but he's like, I probably can't make any money being a sculptor. So I'm going to be an architect. And I'm going to do sculpting on the side. My brother is like a world renowned sculptor, but he's a he's a metal fabricator. So he gets hired to do commission jobs and stuff like that. My mom would love to do photography and painting full time, but she worked at Northeastern for 35 years in the art department. And it's like, no matter how busy I get with music, I always have this this. Uh, like a job or something that's more full-time and more um, stable so that I know that when this person over there calls me and says, I want to make a record and I listen to that music, I'm like, you're really good. And they say, I don't have a budget to, to afford you. And I say, that's okay. I want to play on your record. This thing over here pays my bills for the month kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to be on your record kind of thing. So I have the flexibility to say, I'm going to do this, this gig, or I'm going to take on this project because I think there's a lot of potential and I, I really enjoy this artist and I may not be making my rate, but you know what? I'm not going to say, well, I can't do it because I need to, you know, so my dad always instilled that on me. It's probably, you know, whoever's dealt with me, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, there was somebody gave me a nickname in a studio once jokingly because they know what I do and how I do it. And they called me Johnny pro bono. And it was <laughs> like, because I was always doing work, you know, because I, because this is how you build your name. No matter mm -hmm. if my name's already built, I'm still trying to build my, mm -hmm. my name up to try and get better, bigger and better opportunities. Um, and I was like, it was kind of funny because people kind of looked over and like, that's exactly what you are. You're, you're the guy that, you know, oftentimes our archetype will say, I got you on a project and I know that you will never ask for any money. So I got the money for you. And um, so don't worry about that because you'll be like, what's your rate? And I'll be like, hey, you know, I'm just looking, <laughs> you know, a high five or a hug would be great kind of thing. And it's like, no, no, I'm getting you your rate, you know? Yeah. But, you know, yeah. So, but you know but what? Like Jonathan, I just have to say, like, that's one thing that creative people like 
I always say that like the creative person, the person creating the music or the art or whatever should not have to deal with the financials because you want to be, you want to be making music. You want to be making art, doing what you do and not having to worry about that, the, that other side of things. Cause that kind of like clouds your, your creativity. It gets in the way. It makes you think too much. And I, I feel like, you know, that's, that's one of the things I always say, like the creative person. So you have, you have the archetype, like taking care of that for you. That's great. He's, he's advocating for you in that aspect, but it, it allows you to just let yourself go. And that's a really good point that you made about like your, your family having something else going on, being able to do their art on the side, because that allows like them to separate those two things, right? The creative part is just creating um, yeah. and not, and not worrying about like how much will this sell for? I think, I think that's when things get a little bit clouded sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, what happens if somebody came to me and was like, Hey, I really want you on my project. What's your rate? And I said, well, it's $200 a song. And they're like, Oh, I, I really can't do that. It's only a hundred dollars. Okay. I'll do it for a hundred dollars. Like what, what that makes me look like such a ding dong, you know, <laughs> you know, for, for me to be like, I just knocked off a hundred dollars. So like, it's like, there's no, you don't putting any value on yourself, which is super mm -hmm. important. But mm -hmm. I'm also not going into these with that mindset. I come right up front and say, what's your budget? I will work within your budget because I really feel that, you know, that there's a bigger picture kind of thing here. Um, but, you know, that's an artist's artists in, in business don't necessarily go, you know, hand in hand very mm -hmm. well. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me like, oh, you got to change that. You got to put like a monetary value. You got to, you know, that's, you're not putting value. It's like, Hey, you do you, I'm going to do me. I like what I do. I'm happy to do stuff. I play the drums. This isn't a right. chore for me. I get a day off to spend in the studio with my, with my best bud and producer and I get to make some music. Well, you're going to get, what, what am I going to do? You're going to give me $200 or a hundred dollars. I'm going to go spend that on oysters somewhere in Boston kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, this isn't yeah. life, this isn't life changing kind of thing. Um, right. That's just my mindset. I don't, yeah. this isn't a, this isn't a like fiscally responsible conversation for your listeners to. Right, right. No, know, but, but it's important. It is important though. Yeah. Everyone has their own view on like how to do their business and how to make things work for them. That's the important part, right? The, the, the important part is that you're making the decision for yourself that will make you the happiest. Yeah. And will fulfill you. And, yeah. and you know, it's different for everybody. But the I always say, like, the most important thing is that you choose the route that's going to make you happy. Um, because if you can be rich and unhappy, and what what good is that? No. Right? And if some mega superstar has a budget to pay me my rate, great. Let them pay the rate. I'm not going to, you know, ask somebody right. that's working five jobs just so they can go in the studio and make their record. I'm not going to put them out. Kind of thing but right right to each their I, own. I understand that and you know and and talking about the creative aspect of what you do um i have seen some of the things that you have put your creative mind into um one part of that would be the symbol projects that you've done oh, yeah. uh reimagined right and yeah. taking taking symbols and thinking about what they could be if they were altered a bit and you mentioned your brother who does metal fabricating and, and you work together on this project with your vision. And um, I, I love that you guys work together on, on the projects and I would love for you to tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So this was another, like, this is when, I, you know, when I can't sleep at night, you know, and I, I'm like, what else could I do? What is there else? What else can I do to make something unique and cool? And, you know, my brother's like one of my biggest, inspirations he's he's like off the charts the most talented person that i've ever known in my entire life um and you know i had all i have all of these you know just over the years you know you get symbols they crack you kind of put them to the side kind of thing and you know i'm always like what what can we do this and we're anytime i'm in the studio with him i'm always like what what can we do I, we should do something different everybody's trying to do something different so I was like, I was trying to find a, a situation in which art and functionality for both our worlds 
you know, his he's an art his artwork is not necessarily function. My world is I need functioning, you know, materials in order to be successful. But what happens if we kind of bridge the two things and we made something that was cool looking aesthetically, but also sounded cool. And mm -hmm. you know, you've worked in the the symbol game for your whole life. I mean, you're you're at the forefront of some of the like coolest, you know, um, uh, prototypes and and designs and stuff like that. Always trying to think of new new sounds and new new you know how can we get a sound to an artist that they don't already have kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's super inspiring to me. Same thing with with drums. It's like you know these things have been around for thousands, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. How many more ways can you change them? You know, kind of thing. And there's always there's always way to to think outside the box, kind of thing. So. I decided to like, we made this one project. I, I don't remember what it was, but I was like, it'd be really cool if like, there was like some sort of like mosaic or like a shattered symbol that we kind of put back together to see like what it looked like. And my brother's like, yeah, we could do that. And it's, you know, the funny thing is, it's like, I have these visions that are taking me weeks and months to figure out. And he's like, uh, I got an hour, let's do it. And it's like, yeah. comes up perfectly kind of thing. And it was an opportunity for me to like hang in the studio with my brother, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, he's like my, my like best bud, you know, and we found like a common area and he actually was really excited. He needed something new in his life. So we came up with these ideas and that first one that I posted went like, I, I don't know, viral, I guess it went viral, but it went yeah. viral, you know? And the funny thing is like, they look cool. And then people, you know, the, the, the hate comments that I would get for chopping up a symbol as if like, as if like I was taking food away from like needy people or something like that. I was like, it's a symbol. It it was yeah. it was it was good. It was broken anyways. Um, but all of that led to a lot of exposure for this thing. And I everything I made I used in the studio with Arc, you know, with the archetype, and we put them on records. And mm -hmm. so it was pretty cool. But um, I brought that one. I have if you want to see it. Um, yeah, please. Uh, I hope it's still together because we've been sitting in my uh, closet. But this was the <laughs> first like prototype. Um, Very cool. For anyone know. who's listening and not seeing this happening, um, so Jonathan and his brother they basically took a broken K crash symbol, right? Yeah. There we go. K dark crash and part of it, you know, they they chop up into smaller pieces and then put put it back together. Uh, using their rings, right? That you attached it with. Yeah, like little, like yeah, like little, like um, yeah, rings. Yeah, they are, yeah. Um, yeah. It was yeah, and this one, this one, like people like I don't know, lost their mind is a is like probably too much, but um, it was just an idea of what you know. This was this was an aesthetic thing, and it actually turned out when I put it on the hi hat, you know, because it sits and it's crunchy. You know, mm -hmm. everybody, you know, it's like. Everyone was so mad. They're like, the dark crash is the most beautiful sounding symbol in the world. It's like, <laughs> so go get a dark crash. I didn't like ruin right. all dark crashes, you know. Um, yeah, by chopping that one up, you 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 ruined all of them for everybody. Yeah, like no dark crashes will ever be good anymore because I cut, you know. Um, yeah, but, and you know what? Some sometimes you need to experiment with things to see what happens, right? I when I when I was at Zildjian, I would always ask, what if? Right. So what if we did this? What if we did that? And you have to ask those questions. You have to be curious about what something will sound like or if I do this, then what? And so well, I love that. And I and I told you that when when you did that first symbol, I was like, this is this is fantastic. And to be honest with you, like even, you know, even though it's like something that can't be sold, even like, you know, the symbol companies were like, hey, that's really cool. I mean, if you're an in, if you're if you're a music company, it's about innovation. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, how many symbols has Zildjian made over the course of you know the six hundred years they've been around that don't sound good or that right. weren't a good idea or that right. led to something else? So, and the funny thing was, it was like, arch the archetype um, is always kind of like, anytime we're doing like sounds for his, you know, for his, for beat packs or anything like that, he's always like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got this. He's like, 
I got all that stuff. I already got a, a nice sounding crash and I already got a mm-hmm. cool sounding rad. We got millions of those. You know, he's like, I use Nate Smith's drum pack all the time. Like it yeah. sounds great. I want something that nobody else has. I want a symbol mm-hmm. that's chopped up and sounds like, like nothing that you want it to sound like so that I can bring it into my, you know, pro tools or reason or whatever. And make it unique so that I can say, we only got this sound because you and your brother chopped up cymbals for three hours kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. And so it was funny, but the amount of people like with this one, people like remade this, you know, symbol, they were like, I did the same exact one that, that Jonathan, or they didn't tag me in it. And they're like, I made this thing. Nobody else did you know, whatever. So <laughs> made it, so made it dumb like that. Um, yes. Yeah. I know. I, I get it. But like, I mean, it, it, anyone listening can't, maybe you can hear the smile on my face, but if you're, if you're watching this, you can see the smile on my face because this is like, this is the kind of thing that fuels me and my creativity. And I think this is why it's so important because even if you made a symbol that can't be recreated for the commercial market for whatever reason, right. Um, or it can't be mass produced for whatever reason, because it's, it's very specific to what, how you made it. The sound can be inspirational. Someone can say, Oh, I love that sound and I want to get it somehow, or I want to try this. But, and then the look of it, that's inspiring too, because you can, there are things that maybe that triggers in people's head to create in their own way, a really unique looking symbol. So, or product in general, it doesn't just have to be a symbol, but um, I love that. I, you you know who I am when it comes to sound and innovation and the, the look of things too. And to me, that's like, that's what it's all about. Like the experimentation and then coming up with something that can actually be used to make music like how great is that like you just created a unique musical sound that your producer enjoys and needs for you know to create his music so like how does it get better than that yeah and it was so funny because my brother like would read the comments and he would get so frustrated he's like because people are like you know like geez i've always i've always wished that i could afford a dark crash and it was like, I don't even, I don't even know you existed. If you want me to send you a dark crash, I'll send you a dark crash. You know, <laughs> kind of thing. But it's like, I was like, Mike, the converse, it's about the conversation. Like I'm, yeah. is, if people are talking about it, you know, that's a good thing, you know, kind of, kind of thing. But this was yeah. fun. If we made a, we made a few more, I brought a couple that would, but if they want to see like, you know, all of them, you know, I documented and put them on my Instagram. Um, but it was just a fun project for me to do with him and, and nobody was hurt, you know, you know, yeah. nobody got hurt and the industry has stayed the same and all is well, you know, with, with all that. But it's, yeah. it was definitely something that it was like, I used to talk about how, like, I was like, geez, I always thought it was going to be like some great song I played on that brought visibility to my name or like some like artist that I play with. No, it was a symbol that I chopped up with yes. my brother. <laughs> you know what? And the thing is too, like I was getting, people were sending me, um, people from like literally all over the world were sending me your content with these symbols and saying, yeah. have you seen this? How cool is this? Did you check this out? You know, I'm like, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> I know him. I probably sent him that symbol. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. Um, but you know, it's just, that's incredible to me. I love that when my friends you know, it, it's not a song, but it's, but it's something that used your creative mind. And then the aspect of it that you got to meld your art with your brother's art and spend time together and bond, like that's priceless. That was, that was it. That was actually it for me. For me. It was, I've watched him do artwork, his own artwork, his, his whole life, you know, mm-hmm. and I've always been like, so cool. Like I just sit there and watch him do artwork for hours. And this was an opportunity for us to do a project together. It was like, wow, that's, Ooh. That's full circle. Absolutely. It is. It's amazing. Well, I, I am super happy for you with that stuff and I hope you keep, you keep creating. And, um, you know, I also like want to share before we run out of time, we have to share your big, big news. And a lot of people who follow you on Instagram already know this because you did announce it, but tell us what is happening next week. So, Ooh, so next week, well, I guess this is this week now, June 27th, a week from today, um, 
for that week, I'm going to be the guest drummer on Seth Meyers, uh, sitting in with the 8G band. So that was a that was a goal I made for myself, I think seven or eight years ago, to try and get on their radar and to have it come to fruition is like, you know, it's so, a, so yeah, exciting. That, I mean, so, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, tell it, tell us what that entails. Um, it entails that I, I, I have no information. I mean, I know my, my, <laughs> my friends have, I have friends have done it, but it, yeah. it's like you go down there and you sit in uh, with the band and you play the songs that they, you know, want you to play during a typical live late night show. And, but I think the thing that's different is, is this is a part of the segment that the guest drummer is like, actually like a, uh, gets a moment, say, hey, we're excited to have, Seth says, hey, we got a moment to shine light on this person that we've invited to come down here. And mm -hmm. I think in the drum world, this is such a big nod of respect. Um, I mean, if you look at the names of the people that have done it, it's like, these are all the people that inspire me literally every single day. So to even sit on that same seat that they sat on is, you know, it's, it's, this is, for me, this is what it's all about. I know that there are people that go on, they're like, oh, I've done it twice already, or I'm just doing this because I have the week off, and then I go fly off to do other, you know, great things, you know, that they have going on. It's like, this is, for me, it's like, this is something that I set as a goal for myself so long ago, and to just kind of make sure that I saw it through I said, I don't know when it's going to happen. You never know when it's going to happen. I just knew that if I keep working on it, maybe maybe the opportunity will will present itself. And it was like, and my list, my bucket list stuff is, is you know, I have the list that I made when I was 12. And then I have this one that I've made over the last decade. And this was number, like, number two for me. You know, this was, this is a big deal to at least be invited. I mean, to be considered would be an honor, to be invited is like next level um and to check off your number two on your bucket list is that uh, to me that's what this is what it is because then i check that box off and then i make another one yes and, go, and then i go after that one i love that i love that i'm so this, was, so this, this podcast was number one so i'm checking <laughs> out one two. i love thank you for saying that that is <laughs> but but we have been talking about this for quite a while yeah. i have to say that um, but no, I, let's, let's talk about the, the bucket list thing, because I was recently talking with, um, Brandon Steinecker, um, you know, and we, we chat every once in a while, check in with each other. And one of the things that we talk about is the, the whole, like, like the goals, right. And like setting your goals. And, um, he's someone who I see as always setting goals and achieving them. Um, you're another person that I see that way as well. And I, um, I also, when I set goals and really kind of, it's not something where you have a list of 10 things, you complete those 10 things and then you're good for the rest of your life, right? Like you're, you're always creating new goals, setting new goals, um, because part of it, part of the whole thing is the process of getting there. And, you know, and it, and you have to like, think about enjoying that process along the way. Because, you know, if you're not enjoying the process, then like 90% of your time is not enjoyable, right? Like, so I, I see you as that person too. And I just love that this is something that's like come to be for you because you deserve it. It's going to be super fun. Well, well, thank you. It goes for me. That's what keeps you kind of like hungry to to keep to keep going and the the funny thing a lot of the goals that i set for myself are not so you know it's kind of like your career or whatever you're passionate about it's like in order to get those goals or check off those lists it's like 99 percent of it is your own hard work you do everything you can you have control of you can make sure that you're good at what you do that you Put it out in the world that you do everything that you need to do but that one percent is the luck piece that that stuff that you have no control over and mm -hmm. that's the, that's the frustrating part because it's like i've done everything i could i can't control this this last piece because like 
for me, the big, the big one, my number one is to be able to play at the Boston Garden. I grew up going there to look up at the banners and to be on stage and look up and, and to be at the Boston Garden. That's number one. I have no control. I don't know how or what or which artist is that big enough to be playing the Boston Garden and how I would be the drummer for that situation. I don't know. I don't know how that, that, gets, that box gets checked off but it's going to get checked up. I'm pretty mm -hmm. pretty positive I'm gonna keep working to somehow put myself in a place where that box can get checked off kind of thing. But like, for me, it's like when you check off a box that you've been trying to check off for a long time, you've, you've, put your, you've taken that 99% that you have control over. And when it happens, that means that 1% you have no control over also put, you know, took place, you know, so mm -hmm. that you were able to come there. And, and that's what makes it kind of exciting because I think a lot of people put timetables on these, on these bucket lists. And it's like, you don't have a timetable for this. You just have to keep working at it. And when, when you check it off, you check it off. Mm -hmm. So when I check off a big one, I immediately make another big one. And if it happens in a week later, or if it happens 10 years from now, it's, I'm going to check it off. I just don't know when. And I think that's the part that makes me hungry all the time to keep putting myself in a situation that potentially could um, end up being that I get to 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 check off uh, check off. But and they're my goals. I mean, for somebody else, that those aren't the same bucket list items. You know, those are right. you know those are silly. I remember one time my bucket list when I was a young kid was to play David Letterman. I've mm -hmm. always wanted to play David Letterman. Well, David Letterman doesn't have a show anymore. Right. So that box can never check off. But I did play Jimmy Kimmel. So it's like, it's sort of like a half a check, you know, because yeah. I got to do a late night TV show. It's not David Letterman. Maybe someday David Letterman will be like, I'm going to do a one night only and do my show one more time and I get to do it and I get to fully check off that box. But, you know, you kind of, you weigh the, you have to adjust, you have you have to adjust, adjust right? Yeah. Um, but it's still fun. I still really yes. enjoy this. It's so great. It's so great, Jonathan. I, I just, you know, congratulations on everything that you have accomplished up to this Thank point, you. everything you're working on. And um, anyone who is listening and watching, check out Jonathan at JMU drums on Instagram and next week on the Seth Meyers show with the eight grand band. And I'm sure it's going to be an amazing manifestation of your number two on your checklist. It's I hope so. I just kind of want to like do it and then be like, <laughs> I know that feeling. I get that feeling too. And yeah. then I just try to remember, rem remind myself to like enjoy the moment too. Absolutely. So definitely, Absolutely. definitely take some great pictures while you're I'm there. Going to. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Cannot wait to see them. And um, yeah. And I know I will see you in person very, very soon. Um, but until then, take care and we'll keep on following you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you for tuning in today. Join us each Tuesday for new episodes of Sarah Hagen Backstage.